so Matt has very kindly volunteered to talk to us about ClojureScript, and uh, I'll just hand over straight to you now. Excellent. Cool. Um, do I need to stand there? Go anywhere, it's fine. Okay, I'm cool. Hello everybody, I'm Matt, um, and uh, I very foolishly volunteered a few weeks back to uh, talk about closure scripts. Um, so I, I write software for a living, but I don't write closure and closure script for a living. Um, I've, I'm not a professional, um, not sorry, not a, a trained software engineer either. I didn't do a um, computer science degree at university, did a degree in geography and geology, and actually work in um, a firm that basically deals with geospatial data. That's kind of my, my area of interest. I have, however, been a um, professional software engineer now for not 10 years or so, um, and have kind of been backfilling as I go along um, the computer sci science -y stuff as I go. You know, uh, you kind of learn the bits that you need in order to get the job done, and then um, have an interest in those things that uh, perhaps are on the periphery, but you think uh, could be, a, be useful and be interesting. And uh, one of the areas that um, has kind of been on that list, on the uh, useful and interesting list for a long time, has been Lisp. Um, and uh, more recently, a Lisp dialect called Clojure and Clojure Script. Um, so we are talking to Jack, and he said uh, we could do a compile to JS theme for, um, for Brum.js. And uh, I think Jack's done some uh, work with the Scala variant that compiles to JS. I've done um, some with, uh, with Clojure Script, so here I am. Um, any uh, errors or omissions are all entirely my own fault, um, but uh, let's, let's dive in and see what we can learn. So, uh, so closure script, uh, I've got a few definitions, um, and they kind of go down, down, down. So you've got closure script, the dialect, dialect of the closure programming language that compiles to JavaScript, that's good, as we're from JS. Um, and that's from, I think, probably the only book that's available on closure script as it currently stands um, out on O'Reilly. Um, it probably is the only book because it's a fairly young language, it's only been around for I think it's four or five years now, um, and um, it's changing quite rapidly. Jack asked earlier what's the development experience like, and the answer is very changeable. So in a matter of weeks or months, uh, you'll find that someone else has thought about um, improving the experience to such an extent that what you've learned previously, you kind of have to go back and, and, and relearn. But um, it's a, an interesting area and lots of activity in the community makes it quite uh, quite exciting to work to. So, it's a dialect of closure. So what's closure? So closure is a dialect of Lisp. Okay, um, and That's a language created by um, Rick Hickey. Rick Hickey um, is, uh, is a guy that has plainly thought a lot about um, programming and programming languages over the years and I think pr really came to a point where he thought um, I really like Lisp, um, I, I really like building um, fairly complex systems, and in particular likes building systems that handle things like concurrency well. Um, and let's see what we can make that um, can improve on the current status quo. Um, it's down as a general purpose programming language, um, and it's very much a functional language, as quite a few Lisp dialects tend to be. Although Lisp in itself doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be functional. You can do object orientated programming in Lisp, you use something like Common Lisp. Uh, there's a whole host of options to, in, with regards to the, the style of programming that you, you apply. So it's a Lisp. So, what's a Lisp? So, Lisp has been around for a very long time. So I googled this in the pub just before I came here. Um, and it was uh, 1958 that John McCarthy originally penned um, Lisp, which is a hell of a long time ago, isn't it? So apparently it's, uh, this is from Wikipedia, um, it's the, the second, um, most historic language still in, in use today, uh, Fortran being the, the one before it. Um, it's been around a hell of a long time, um, so very long history. Um, it's distinctive, fully parenthesized Polish prefix notation, we'll come on to that. Um, but uh, John McCarthy, when he designed it, he, he was very interested in AI, he was very interested in, um, in functional programming, um, even though I don't think it was called that at, at that time. Um, and he was looking to um, provide a fairly pure um, way of expressing computation. Um, there's a, a whole um, heap of research around lambda cal calculus, which is basically a, one of the foundations of functional programming. Um, and this was like a, a formal proof for that. And I think the story goes that actually there was some academic paper written 
with the syntax. And then someone actually went and then implemented the syntax. And they were like, oh, this could actually work as a proper programming language. Um, oh, the other thing to mention actually about when Lisp was invented, I think it was quite significant in that um, it cited that things like garbage collection go right back to, to Lisp. So some of the things that we take for granted today were implemented way back in 1958 or just after um, in some of the, the first Lisp interpreters. Dynamic language. Um, and LISP stands for list processing. It's all about transforming data. So this fully parenthesized Polish prefix notation. Whoa, looks like that. You'll see a lot of parentheses in LISP. And the, uh, the idea is that you're, you've got a very minimal syntax. Actually, when you look at it initially, you think, Christ, there's a lot to take in there. But actually, the structure of the, the program, the structure of the, the language is extremely simple. Um, so I'll take you through this. So what we've got here, we've got um, got a form that uh, starts here, ends here. Just trust me on that. Okay. Um, and then this is basically the output of evaluating that that form. So um, you have in the first position um, conventionally um, a function, and then following that the arguments. And those arguments can either be data or functions or some a primitive. So in this case, uh, this is actually some some closure or closure scripts. Um, so you've got uh, a let function, and let basically allows you to define some local variables, so it gives you some local bindings. Um, so we're saying let uh, links, so this is actually a vector that's been passed, so that gives, allows you to define uh, one or more local variables, if you like, so a list of local variables. There's one called links, um, and this is actually a snippet from um, a little toy thing that I've, I'll show you later. Um, so this is just a a label, so that's basically your, your variable name. Um, and then here you've got the, the its value, so it's a, again another vector, so think of it as, as an array, and each of uh, each element in that array is a um, an object, a map, hash map, um, which contains in this case a title um, keyword. So these, these are actually keywords as opposed to strings, um, but essentially the same thing. So a title um, and some tags. Um, so that's another keyword and that's another other um, vector within. So that from there to there defines a, a local variable, uh, thanks to this let. And then down here we use another, call another function, filter, and we're passing it, in this case, a anonymous function. There's some syntax sugar to allow you to define anonymous functions. Um, and this is basically filtering out um, from this list um, all of those items, all of these, that contain a tag with CLJS in. So we're, we're passing in the links from here and applying this function, which basically gets us the, um, filters out all of the items, and we get this printed out. So it's, it's horrendous to look at at first, isn't it? You think, Christ, how can you ever work with that? Sorry, a line breaks and space insignificant uh, to the language. So, uh, yeah, line breaks are insignificant. Um, spaces um, aren't. Um, so you could have separated these items with a comma, but um, in a language like uh, Clojure, actually commas are just treated as white space. So you can include a comma um, just for convention and convenience, but actually it doesn't make any um, syntactic difference. Um, and you've got a number of uh, literals for, for data types like hash maps and, and vectors. So that is fully parenthesized Polish prefix notation, for which I only learned the full formal name a few days back while researching it. Um, one of the things it does give you, though, is it gives you um, a very um, simple way of expressing your, your program. So the syntax that's involved um, is actually very small. So you don't have all of the syntax of defining um, blocks with, with braces, um, operators, um, like equals and um, plus, etc. You, you just don't have any of that. It all boils down to functions and then the um, the notation for for calling and grouping those. Okay, another another cool word, homo iconicity. So what what the hell is that? So all code in the language can be accessed and transformed as data. So this is another um, aspect of all those parentheses. So what you're basically looking at is both code and data at 
the same time. Um, and this is one of the other novel things about, about Lyft. You think about uh, another programming language like, like JavaScript, and you're very clearly writing code when you're writing code. Um, and if you wanted to transform that code, um, there's no clear way of saying, I've got this block of code, and I, I can't clearly treat that as, as data. I can't manipulate it very easily. There are some, um, some macro languages um, for, um, for JavaScript, but they're few and far between. And generally, they've got their own syntax. Because the data um, and the, the code is one and the same, um, you, can, you can take this, um, this code and manipulate it um, at runtime in such a way that um, you can perform some, uh, some interesting manipulation. And one of the things about Lisp um, that um, people quite often bang on about is the fact that it has a very powerful macro system which allows you to um, basically extend the language in, in such a way um, that, that you, de you desire and write high level abstractions so you can write your own little um, domain specific languages quite easily within in, um, in Lisp because um, you can pass into um, a macro uh, an actual block of code and then within a macro, you can transform that code to be um, a, a, another form ready for, for execution. So, what are the, some of the cool things that Closure and Closure Script gives you? And kind of what's important about the language? Why the hell would you want to um, learn to use Closure and Closure Script? Um, well, the other thing, actually, I haven't mentioned about Closure Script. I said uh, about Closure is that Closure Script compiles to JavaScript. Closure compiles to um, JVM bytecode, so that's, um, and Closure has been around um, for um, quite a bit longer. I think probably around the eight to ten years mark, um, and um, has it's got like a, a much more mature, uh, mature and stable um, user base and um, development activity. It's still developing at a reasonable pace, whereas Closure Script is that bit younger and much more active. So these are kind of some of the key things that. You might look at the language and think um, that it was, uh, it was worthwhile picking up and investigating. So one of the first things is immutable data structures. So um, in a language like JavaScript, you can pretty much mutate anything. Um, strings you can't, numbers you can't, they are they're primitives, so you, you can't actually change those. Um, but virtually everything else, arrays, um, objects, etc., you can basically take an existing instance and you can tack something on, you can delete something from it if it's an object, you can change a value, um, so you've got lots of flexibility and that can be a good thing, it can mean that the language is very um, easy to, to work with and to extend, um, but it can also be a, a bad thing and a so source of um, hard to find bugs where you, you have an object passed over here to a function, um, it changes it in some subtle way, but you've got a reference to that object over a this other part of your, your system, and it wasn't expecting anything to change, and it's not getting notified of that change, and all of a sudden, in some circumstance, so it just doesn't work, and you, you kind of you think, well, how the hell did that change? And it can be really quite tricky to, to see the relationship between them. One of the, the ways around that sort of um, unexpected mutation of objects is to implement um, immutable data structures. And what they are, um, are basically, um, extending out the, this concept of, of a value, like you would have a string or a number, to um, the more complex <coughs> types, like objects and um, vectors and lists. Uh, so you've got a, a small number of them, of lists, vectors, sets. So a set is a distinct um, collection of things uh, without any duplicates. Um, and hash maps, so key value pairs of, um, of items. And all of these things in, in uh, Clojure and Clojure scripts are immutable. So if you've got, say, a vector, so think of that as an array in JavaScript, and you, you add some items to it, um, if you then um, take that, that vector and you pass it to a function that, that modifies it, what you'll actually get back is not the same thing modified with a new item tacked in. You'll get a new value back, which will be this, this new representation of the, of the data. So the existing reference doesn't get get altered, get a new thing back that um, you can then use and happily treat as an actual value just like you would a string or a number. 
And once you get used to that, it's really cool. And actually, now that I use Python and um, JavaScript array um, methods and functions, you think, crikey, does it really do that to the, the internal object and then return me the length of the, the, uh, the array once you've manipulated it? Can't you just make that change and return me the, a new, new array um, that I can then use for the, the rest of my, um, my program? So is that copy on write? Uh, so it's not copy on write, no, it does some clever stuff behind the scenes where um, the data structure of the system actually shares the structure. Um, it, it, I've listened to a couple of videos um, that Rick Hickey's put out about it and it's um, interesting stuff but a little bit over my head to be honest. But the, the idea I think is that it's structural sharing so that you get good performance um, but you also get the benefit of, of them basically being uh, immutable. So behind the scenes, there's some clever stuff going on um, that, as a user, kind of don't have to uh, have to be aware of. Okay, now if, uh, if you have objects inside the array and you make a copy of the array, does object have the same reference as space? No, not in this case. Copy it as well. Um, so, uh, from a user in a user space scenario, it's a complete value. So you can think of it as a as a distinct thing, like like the number ten. It's a, an actual value that you've returned back, even though you've got lots of objects. It's like doing a deep clone. Um, on a, so it does object. Deep clone. So if you filter an array into a new array, this array has a copies of object. Yeah. The so it doesn't one. actually do a deep clone. It uses a more sophisticated so way of that's kind of persistent data structure. Yeah. So uh, that's array is a new reference itself, but the objects inside uh, this array stay the same. The uh, I don't know to be honest. I don't know behind the scenes whether whether they are. But the, the whole approach is that you're not really looking at tracking the references to these yeah. objects. Now, they are distinct values, like I say, like, like numbers and strings. Um, and hence, you're, you're, not, uh, you're not able to, say, keep a reference to um, the item that's in position 0, for instance, in a, in a vector, and then um, use that, that elsewhere. Um, if you do that, if you take, get the item from that position, you'll get a new, new object. And, and that object is then again standalone. Um, How does that compare to what PHP does? I don't know. Oh, yes, because you can choose between reference and value. Can't and you? Most, most of it's by value, isn't it? Yes, time, it is. Compared to these other languages where it does, where you know, like in JavaScript, where it by default modifies it in place. That's right, and you get a reference. I don't know, to be honest. I haven't really, haven't really even thought about the, um, the parallel with that. It's been a long time since it's done PHP. Just sounded like from the description. Yeah. It's very similar to what they do. So, um, so here we, we say functions um, generally update and then return a new copy. Um, so all of the standard library um, tends to work in that way, apart from a few small um, exceptions where, for performance reasons, you can actually say within a given function that you're going to mutate a given um, object for for very performance sensitive um, code. But generally when you're, you're reading all of the tutorials and introductory material, all that's kind of forgotten about. It's only when you really get into the detail that you find that there's a way of taking these position data structures, making them mutable, operating on them, and then returning a, 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 an, a mutable value um, at the other end. Um, it, like I say, it eliminates a whole class of bugs caused by mutation, and people like Rick Hickey, I think, have said that <coughs> Um, garbage collection brought um, massive benefits um, because you can stop worrying about um, having to clean up all of your, your references, or to a large extent. Um, and it's thought that immutable data structures may be in a similar class in terms of um, helping to eliminate a whole whole class of issues within a a, um, a programming language um, because you, you're not um, you're not any any longer dealing with these problems of changing state without you, you knowing. And, and this is a link actually up to um, a post that I put onto a, um, a mailing list for a JavaScript library, uh, a mapping JavaScript library. I was writing a component for it. I wanted to get the center of the map. And um, you call get center, you get back an array, which is um, the x and y values. Great. Um, I then wanted to manipulate um, that value 
so that I could place this component in the map in the appropriate place. So my first thought was, okay, I've got this value, and I performed some operations to shift um, the values, and found that it broke the whole of the library, because what I was actually getting back was a reference to the actual value that it was using, the actual array it was using, to keep track of where the center of the map was. So if I was mutating it, um, I then pan the map, and instead of the map moving like this, the map went <clears throat> because I'd changed its internal state, which was essentially private, um, and caused you know, unintended consequences. So that was opposed to say, maybe you should clone it before passing it um, to the uh, back from the, the call to, to get center. Uh, the guy that I was talking to actually didn't agree. He thought, oh, we should just improve the docs and say, um, clone it yourself. You know, when you get it back for performance reasons. But you know, that, that was just like, it was a really subtle um, area, but it became very obvious at that point um, that if you just got values back and the value that I got back was distinct from the, um, the value that was being used by the underlying library, that, would have, that problem just would never have happened. Um, like I say, it was a two element array, it was a tiny, tiny piece of data. Um, and the other cool thing about immutable data structures is they are values and you therefore get deeper quality and that's really cool when you think about it. So in JavaScript, if you were to, to see if these two um, arrays in JavaScript are equal, false. It's like, come on, the two, two arrays that contain three numbers, the numbers are the same, in the same order, surely they're equal. They're not in JavaScript, are they? Because they're different references um, to different arrays, if defined in this way. In enclosure, then you'll get um, a truthy value out of this. And this is a, another example. I sh maybe I should have used this for the, the prefix notation. Would have been much easier, wouldn't it? So this is a function, in this case, called um, equal. Um, and then these are the two values that have been passed to it. And, and this one returns true. God, that was easier to explain, wasn't it? Um, but, uh, and this, as I say, works for, um, for a whole host of other data structures and um, it also works for them, them being nested. Um, immutable data structures are incredibly cool when it comes to concurrent programming, which you don't really get in, in ClojureScript or JavaScript. You know, even web workers, you can't share global state, can you? Um, so you can go and do some concurrent stuff, but you can't actually um, share state between them. Um, so they're really cool in the enclosure on the JVM because they provide a means of very easily, quite trivially, um, doing parallel and concurrent um, programming because the values that you're passing aren't going to be um, inadvertently um, changed by different um, threads of execution. Um, but they're also quite useful in um, environments that are single-threaded or predominantly single-threaded like um, JavaScript and hence ClojureScript because they just give you this guarantee of um, not having things change under your feet and the steep um, equality. I felt quite passionate about that. <laughs> um, functions. So uh, Clojure and ClojureScript, Lisp, um, is well suited to um, functional programming. Um, Clojure and ClojureScript really are, they have a focus on um, practical um, functional programming. Um, the core library provides a, a wealth of pure functions for um, transforming data. That's kind of um, the core of the, the language. You know. Lisp is a a list processing language. Um, it's all about taking data in, transforming it in some way, and spreading it out, out the other end. Um, Lisps are good at processing lists. They better be. Um, and you've got this simple syntax. But there are a hell of a lot of functions to learn. So I first picked up Lisp and thought, oh, great, really simple syntax. I'll get my head around this in no time. So you read a few lines, see some example code, and you think, yeah, I, I can see. Um, what's happening in terms of the, hey, the, the kind of the, the execution of the program, but then you realise you've got a massive surface of functions to learn, um, because it's a fairly flat um, language. You don't have like an object model with this class has as these methods. You've just got a wealth of functions for for um, dealing with processing this data. So you've got the so some classic functional operations. And you can do all this now in, in JavaScript. You have been able to for quite some time. So things like map, reduce, and filter, they're like some very basic building blocks for um, dealing with um, sequences, collections of things. Um, if you don't use map, reduce, and filter in, in JavaScript, um, and you haven't got to support really old browsers, like 
i.e. 8, is it? It would be the cutoff point. If you can do 9 and up, then, um, then get, get to know them. Get to know that reduce and filter and, and use them because they clean up um, doing all this um, imperative, imperative looping um, by encapsulating your logic in functions. Um, so map here, um, so there's a function, it's in the, in the first position of the list, so it's a function it's going to get called. Um, this is another function, inc, which increments something, and then this is the, the list that we're going to, so it's a vector in this case, that we're going to, going to process. And basically, map goes through and applies this function to each element in turn and returns the, the value. So you, you take one, apply inc, get two. That's the value that goes in that position. You uh, take two, apply inc, get three. That's the value that comes out in that position. So you're just processing through the, the whole list and just applying a function to each. Map can take uh, more than one list. If it takes more than one list, then you get the values from each of the list to, to process, which is can be quite cool. So if you want to um, go through a, a whole um, set of collections, um, and they can actually be, um, they don't all have to have the same length either. So you can take the, you've got two of five and one of three, you'll get go through um, the first three with all three values, and the next um, other, other thing, the, the thing terminates at the, the third. So you're passing it multiple vectors. Yeah, you can do. Branches. You're not passing it a list of lists. You're passing no, no, multiple vectors. vectors. Yeah, yeah, a and, bit and like then, you were using apply. Yeah, so it basically gives you the gives the values it's time. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, reduce um, is a bit like map, but uh, instead of um, actually, it's not a very good reduce. Um, example, but um, I'll explain why now. So reduce is like map, but instead of um, going over each individual value um, and returning that value in its position, um, it reduces it down into a single return value. So in this case, we're, we're summing the values. There's an easier way to do this, basically just called um, sum, which is a, the plus symbol, um, with these values after it, actually. But um, in this case, reduces uh, calling this function, and the first time um, that it will be called, um, it will be called with the, the first item, and you can optionally also specify um, an initial value. So this would actually probably be better written um, in this case if there was a zero as the initial value. I just want to sum them. So you get um, one and zero, um, and then the next time you get two and the previous value, so two and one, you get three. Um, it's just doing a bit of basic maths, you know, just making sure that <laughs> make sure I can follow it, um, and and on and on. So you keep taking the, taking the values and accumulating them um, to that. And in this case, we get fifteen. Yay! Um, but that can be really useful. Reduce for um, for going over a collection of things and doing some computation based on um, the, the the whole of that that collection. Uh, and then filter is fairly straightforward, hopefully. So that allows you to say. Um, in this case, only give me the even values. So range gives you, um, creates you a sequence of, of numbers. Um, so that would be, uh, in this case, 0 to 9. It's not inclusive. It's exclusive. Um, and that gets passed to the even function. And that basically just um, returns true or false as to whether it's um, uh, is even or not. And you then get the results out of this end. So, so they're, they're like really simple building blocks. And like I say, you can use those in JavaScript. You don't need closed script for, for these um, functional um, functional functions. So the functions that take functions. Um, you notice here that each of these functions, they look a bit strange. Don't they? So inc probably looks okay as a function name. Um, plus looks really odd. But that is actually a function in enclosure. So it's not an operator. It's an actual function. And you can pass it as many numbers as you wish to to add. Um, and even this one with a question mark, that's a predicate function. So that basically, if it's, it's a convention, if it's got a question mark on it, it's going to be a predicate that basically returns a truthy value um, based on the, um, as its result. So in this case, it's even or not. Uh, can I ask, with your map example there, you're passing yeah. it a, a vector, yes. right? So you're returning a list. So what's the difference between a vector and a list? Yeah, so Clojure's got, um, a sequence abstraction, um, and you've got a whole host of functions that um, that work on sequences, which is like a generic collection type. Um, and 
quite, quite a lot of these functions will take your, your concrete type and treat it as this subtype. You can think of it um, like the, a base class, if you like, um, which is a, a sequence. And yes, you get back um, a list, although you can, um, in a lot of cases, interchangeably treat um, your vector and your, your list. What's the difference between a vector and a list? Uh, <laughs> what, yeah, it's a good question. So vectors have got, uh, so all of the data types, including things like vectors and, and lists, have different performance characteristics when it comes to um, adding um, elements to the start and end. So certain um, data structures are more efficient at the start, certain at the end. Um, and there are um, also differences around uh, whether they are lazy or not. And lists, uh, sorry, sequences by default, I think, are lazy sequences. So that means that they're not entirely computed um, up front. So if you end up with a very long um, um, list of values, um, you may find that actually only the first n values are actually computed, or the first uh, however many val values you need are computed. Um, so that it's very um, efficient for, for memory. So range is an example that returns explicitly a, a lazy sequence. Although with the values that we've got here, because they're all so short, you'll find that they'll all just um, be evaluated in this case. You do like range, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. And, and as long as you never ask for anything down the far end of the list, yeah. Like yeah, that's right. Or, or you can ask for the down, down that end of the list, but you need to have gone through each of the, the rest and, um, and therefore not stored all of the values. Yeah, that's right. Um, this whole uh, uh, lazy evaluation, it does it in, in chunks behind the scenes. Um, so I think you, it, and you don't really, you're not supposed to know what size the, those chunks are, but uh, for efficiency, it doesn't just do each individual value, it'll do however many values are deemed um, appropriate for performance, uh, and then just um, give you those that, that you asked for. So to give you an idea of the, I said that there are a lot of functions, let me give you an idea of the, hold on, the number of functions. So these are just for sequences. Um, you got all, all those. So shorter sequence from longer sequence, longer sequence from shorter sequence. So you know, these are like adding things, these are um, filtering things out. So there's a whole host of, um, of functions available to you. And initially when you start, you kind of, find a couple that are useful and commonly used and stick to those. And then you tend to, i found that, you know, I've only really been doing closure and closure scripts as a, as a hobby, really, you know. Um, and you'll find that you'll, you'll write some algorithm to do something, and then you'll look back in the standard library and be like, oh yeah, there's that function that does exactly that. And it's a much more elegant um, solution. Um, I think if you're doing closure and closure scripts day in, day out for years and years, you'll get to most of these, but for most people, you'll find a small subset that, that work, and then just progressively feel your way around the, um, the added extras, as it were. I mean, I've found that since doing any closure and closure script that I've been looking for equivalents in um, JavaScript and in, um, in Python, and quite often you'll find quite a few of these, um, these functions available to you, um, but then you come back to closure and think, crikey. Yeah, they've really thought this stuff through. It's got a massive wealth of, um, of experience in doing this sort of transformation. Okay. Uh, practical functional purity. So when you talk about functional programming, everyone talks about pure functions. And uh, if you do Haskell, um, there's this whole area of uh, monads, which is uh, allows you to actually do anything, like write to... Um, the console or to a file. This is really complicated and people get really tied up about actually doing stuff. Because a pure function really can't do anything to affect the outside world. It can do some computation, return a value, but that's it. You can't print it to screen in a, a strictly a, um, functional language. But Clojure is much more pragmatic than that. So it, it very much guides you towards writing pure functions. So the core of pure functions really is not having side effects. So you call a function, it does something by um, its internal workings, but in doing it, it doesn't update some, some arbitrary global state. Um, it doesn't mutate the 
the values that have been passed to it um, without you uh, without you knowing it. Um, it. It tries to keep what it does clean, concise, and easy to reason about. So you, know, you call a function, you get a value out the other side, and, and that's it done. And it hasn't changed anything else. Um, but of course, if you write a program, you want to write to files on disk. You want to put stuff on the screen and all that sort of stuff. So Clojure is much more pragmatic about this, and it allows you to do that in a very straightforward way, just as you would in JavaScript or Python or, or whatever. Um, that's not to say that you shouldn't be looking to implement as much as you can in pure functions. And actually, one of the things that you tend to find is that people will try and isolate out those bits of their program that do need to update some, some state or write to the screen or whatever into distinct places that, that do that. Um, and quite often you'll see functions with a, a bang and exclamation mark at the end. And that basically means it's doing something to um, affect the, the external environment. It's got some side effects. Is that just a... Um, it's just a convention. A convention, yeah. yeah. Just like the question mark is, yeah. So it's not actually in, in force and there's no um, no actual syntactic um, significance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a, a really good thing because you don't get tied up in um, not being able to do things and thinking that you shouldn't shouldn't write, write out to the screen because it's a, a bad, non-pure thing. Uh, JavaScript interop. So you, as Clojure script compiles to JavaScript, you're going to want to deal with things in the JavaScript world. You know, you, you're going to want to write to the console. You're going to want to uh, interact with the DOM. You're going to want to use JavaScript libraries, those sorts of things. So that's all, all important. And luckily, that's all, all very well thought out. So um, a lot of these types, um, if you want to use them, are available. You want to use strings and numbers, probably. It's quite, quite primitive. Uh, you can also use dates um, and um, regex and other JavaScript types. And they're all, they're all available to you. Um, so things like um, dates and regular expressions, they are mutable because they are JavaScript types. And Closure Script doesn't try and um, pretend that they're not. You know, you just have to have to know that. Um, and there are so there's, a, so there's a literal syntax for defining regexes in Closure Script, which is similar to the Closure one. Um, there's a JS namespace which allows you access to these things. Basically, so it's JS forward slash and then the the thing. Um, so date, for instance, um, gives you access to that the date constructor, and that follows through for for all. JavaScript things, so it's not as if there's just a predefined small subset of of uh, JavaScript. Um, if you've got a custom um, JavaScript uh, library that you're using, you can access it via the JavaScript um, namespace. That's like a um, an escape hatch out to the JavaScript. Um, and then there's, there's syntax for reading properties, calling functions, creating in instances. So a couple of examples here. So if you want the string length and you want to call it from the JavaScript string. You use dot hyphen and then the prop property name that'll get you the the um, the length of that string. Um, how many is that? Five is it? Um, and uh, calling a function um, is dot the function name, the thing you're calling it on. So JS console and what you want to print out. Come on, Oh right. So the second parameter is. The JavaScript object yeah. you're calling on. The yeah, first one backwards. begins in dot, which means yeah. I'm a magic JavaScript fit. Because functions always go <laughs> functions always go here in this, this first position. Yeah, so you can't really put the yeah. the console here because that's an object. Um, yeah. so you put put log there. Yeah. You can do some clever things where you can actually extend built in objects with a protocol, so you can make them callable. So you could actually um, I think extend console, pop it here, not need the log, and by default we just log. Yeah. Um, so, presumably, there's not a uh, function called dot log, dot length, dot uh, stuff like that for every possible no. name of thing. So, I assume there's some magic going on with the dot there. What, how does it work? And Why is it just log rather than dot log? Uh, so th that's just the uh, the syntax for calling a JavaScript function and uh, accessing a property. I think the reason they're, they're different is that in JavaScript. It's so fast and loose about uh, functions and where they are defined. So you can just define a function and assign it to a property that they, they can act interchangeably. Um, so this kind of makes it explicit to say, this is a property, dot, hyphen, 
the name, and this is the function, just dot and then the name. Um, and I, I actually read that this has actually been backported into Clojure, I think, now, because in Java, um, it's not so fast and loose in that respect, um, but it was felt that it's actually quite a useful um, convention so that you know whether you're calling a, a native function or a native or accessing a native property. Um, so that's just, just how it is, Stuart. It's just how it is. <laughs> and then there's another dot here. That's significant as well, that dot there. Um, so this is accessing the date, and this is creating, a, creating an instance of it. So that's the way you create an instance. So that give you a date instance. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, it actually does the construction for you. Yeah. So, so, sorry. Sorry, go on. Can I, can I just clarify? So, um, Clojure's programming language, Clojure script, is, is something that somebody wrote in order to, am I right, write something that was like Clojure, but you ended up with JavaScript. That's right. Yeah. So, do you ever use Clojure script without compiling it to JavaScript? Uh, no, you don't. So, you so always compile to the host. It, is it kind of like people who can write Clojure but want to end up with JavaScript? They've got this thing in the middle. Is that the way? You yeah, I think it's people that are like like Lisps and like what Clojure gives you in terms of um, the language, you know, the syntax, the language, yeah. and things like um, the immutable date structures, the mm. pure functions, all that good stuff, mm. um, but they want to target platforms like the browser or Node or yeah. IOJS so when you, or whatever. When you've, got your, when you've written all your Clojure scripts, yep. how, do you compile, how do you get JavaScript out the other end? And if you looked at the JavaScript, would you look at it and think, well, that was quite neat, or would you think, God, that's really horribly written, and I'm, you know, how on earth did you end up with all that? Yeah, probably so, the latter. You go, yeah. whoa! <laughs> so you could yeah. go into so we'll JavaScript and look at it and go, right, I'm going to fiddle with this now, when it's JavaScript. You'd rather yeah, you definitely wouldn't be fiddling with it. Definitely okay. not. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. So I think, I think. Yeah, we come on to it. There we go. Oh, okay. Beautiful segue. <laughs> okay, so uh, so under the hood, what does ClojureScript do? It, uh, there's a, a means of transforming this beautiful Lisp syntax into quite mean looking JavaScript code. Um, and it, it uses Google's Clojure compiler. Now how bloody confusing is that? S instead of J, ridiculous, but anyway. So Clojure compiler has been around, Clo this one, has been around for, um, for quite some time and Google use it internally for a whole host of their, their apps. I think they use it for Gmail and Calendar and all sorts of things. So it's quite a sophisticated tool to take JavaScript, hand-authored JavaScript, and compile it down into um, um, optimized JavaScript for use in the browser. And one of the key things that it does is it's got dead code elimination, so it does proper hardcore dead code elimination. It will actually parse the Syn ab ab abstract syntax, syntax tree, Christ, that was difficult, um, and determine which parts of code aren't actually being invoked in a given um, application, strip them out, so that you end up with a really small executable JavaScript. So it's JavaScript, but that's the bit that will get executed. Um, it does other crazy things, like it's got this concept of code motion, so if you've got several pages in your application, that require different modules of code. Um, it will move the dependencies between um, bundles so that you get just the code that's required um, for each of those individual parts of your, your application. Very sophisticated stuff. It's actually written in Java, um, but spits out um, JavaScript um, at the other side. It has a concept of um, modules, so it's done modules in JavaScript for quite a long time, uh, and also has a concept of dependencies. And basically, ClojureScript makes use of, of that. So Clojure and ClojureScript have proper modules, so you have namespaces. So everything's namespaced. You can't get away with not being namespaced. And the ClojureScript output is built on top of Clojure modules, um, which I think are generally considered um, fairly good. Um, Google Clojure isn't that popular outside of Google. And actually, I've probably said the ClojureScript community, to be honest. <laughs> it's like the guys that, that develop ClojureScript um, so there's uh, one guy, um, David Nolan, I think, that's, I think I've got his name right, um, who's um, one of the, the lead devs on ClojureScript. And quite often he'll sing the praises of Google Clojure compiler. Um, and what he says, you think that makes actual sense. But for some reason it's not caught on outside of, of those communities particularly. Um, 
they've got some crazy hello world type examples uh, that show the dead code elimination, which basically go from an object with a function um, with the calls console.log or something. You know, it's a fairly simple thing, but there's like this boilerplate around it, so they're actually defined a, an object and a method and things. And if you use the advanced optimization, which is when it does all the dead code elimination and all optimizations, you basically get out the end, console.log, your string. <laughs> it just strips everything else out and says, well, this is what this is what the program does, so that's all you need to, to ship. Um, and because of Google Closure, um, Closure Script does pretty well, I think, when it comes to the actual size of JavaScript that gets sent down to the client. Um, it doesn't do as well as if you were hand authoring JavaScript and running it through Closure Compiler itself, but that's perhaps to be expected because you've got other things on top, like these mutable data structures, which are all implemented um, when all said and done in JavaScript. You've got you know, the standard library, essentially, that goes down with it. But um, I think the general feeling is that um, Google Closure does a pretty good job of getting you down to just what you need. Um, React, uh, there's been a few things about React in um, from JS recently, and it's worth, worth a mention, because actually I first heard about React while listening to a podcast that was talking about Closure Script. Um, I thought, oh, that sounds really cool. And I thought, oh, that's JavaScript. I could actually use that in my day job, uh, React, that is. Um, so there's been quite a lot of interest in, in React, which is this, the Facebook framework that allows you to um, provide a, it provides a means of efficiently efficiently rendering a view um, into a, to a web page by dropping data in, um, getting the state of the, the application um, given that data, and then applying those changes to the um, to the, the actual DOM itself to to build build the UI. Um, React kind of that philosophy of dropping data in building a particular state and getting it applied is actually quite functional. You know, it's quite a functional flow. Um, React itself is quite object oriented funnily enough. <laughs> but um, a few people in the ClojureScript community have seen React, thought it's quite a good fit for um, how people tend to write ClojureScript applications anyway. This idea, transform some data, define what your application should look like given that data, and then have um, the nitty gritty of applying it handled for you. Um, and there are a couple of notable um, projects um, of which um, OM is probably the most well known. That actually is a project by David Nolan, who is one of the leads on ClojureScript itself. Um, and OM is really quite sophisticated. It gives you um, this concept of cursor, so you can have a view into application state, so that a component only sees a little bit of a complete application state. So your data is your application state. You've got a little widget, um, and it only needs to know about a little bit. You can pass it a cursor to it, like a view into it, and then um, it can fire some event that updates it, and then that gets cascaded to the rest of the tree. Everything gets re-rendered. I think he even has examples, or maybe it's even the default, where with ARM, um, it actually renders on um, request animation frame. So literally rendering all the time, but it's only ever actually doing um, any updates when things change. And because of these immutable data structures and deeper quality, those checks are really quick to see whether things have changed, and hence it's very efficient. So you get some very high frame rates, um, even though the thing is basically always rendering. So your code's like um, always always live, but only actually doing anything um, when it really needs to. Um, I've done a bit of uh, Regent, which is slightly more accessible than OM. OM, you kind of need to like really dive in and um, and look at the, the essence of it. I wasn't quite that brave, so I've done a little Regent, I'll show you a little thing on that. Um, and then this is um, another library, um, which I shan't try and pronounce as much as I can, um, that came out recently, which is slightly less opinionated than these two. It seems that the trend is actually towards being slightly less opinionated about this stuff and just giving you just the rendering piece. Um, but all of them um, have been well received and I think it's some really interesting work in that area. Show me some code. Oh, so I just wanted to just jump in at that moment and say pizza has arrived. Okay. Are we so, already in an hour? Uh, what do we want to do? Do you want to take a break and yeah, go after pizza, or that's how you or how long? What do people think? Uh, I've probably got another ten minutes, quarter an hour. Okay. Do you want to wait ten minutes for pizza? Pizza. Yeah. Let's do a good job. Pizza yep. break. Pizza break. I didn't want to be that guy, but I am that guy.